Hello and welcome to the final video in my 18th century suit series. I am recreating the suit worn by Blackbeard in the show Our Flag Means Death, but I thought it would be fun to make it more historically accurate. The rules are as follows. I will be using historical patterns and techniques to get the right silhouette, but try to stick as close to the same fabrics and decorations as they use in the show where I'm able to find it and afford it. And today we're finally making the coat. I'm using Reconstructing History 1740s frock coat pattern, a pattern which I would not recommend. And the fabric of choice is a cotton velvet. When picking my fabrics I chose the ones that matched the most, but I feel like they ended up matching pretty well with the one in the show. The main attraction for this entire outfit is the embroidery on the coat. I copied the pattern on screen and began to draw it onto the front panels. I figured out an approximate scale by comparing it to the length of the collar and the cuffs. The costumers are using a modern pattern for this coat, and so the pattern will not match up to mine. The costumers were probably really proud of this piece, and we are fortunate enough to have several behind the scenes photos and even a few showing the progress. The pattern on the front were the ones we have the most references of, so I started here and this will be my reference for the rest of my work. The embroidery consists of three parts. French military wire or a gold soutache or cord, sequins and gold embroidery flossing. After making my pattern I used a silk embroidery thread to mark where my swirls should go. For the easier straight lines, I simply made hard markings with chalk, since this is velvet it will be visible on the front. The costumers have revealed where they sourced the soutache that they used, but I didn't know exactly how much I needed, so I simply could not afford it. Instead, I ended up buying an Indian soutache of a Vetsi. The measurements in the listing said it was 4mm wide, and so I also bought sequins in that size to match. This is the first time I've worked with this, and the first time I'm doing any gold work. I was not aware that the sotage widened. If I had, I would have bought the bigger sequence as well. I stitched the sotage down with a silk thread, pulling it a little as I went to try and avoid it expanding. With a cord you simply bend it when you stitch a corner, but since this is a flat band I folded it and secured it down with several stitches at each sharp corner. While working, I'm wearing the new buckle shoes I bought for this to break them in.
then I filled in with sequins. They look a little small compared to the Satash now, but it takes me a month to receive anything, so I'm not buying a new one because of this. To help the sitage lay nicer I also went in and made a few more stitches. Don't know what this is made of but it smells metallic and coloured my fingers green. If I succumb to lead poisoning know that I went doing something I hated. The final part of the pattern is a decorative stitch with a metallic thread. I bought a beautiful Japan thread for this. A Japan thread is a thread that has been wrapped in paper to give it a metallic look. Because of this you have to be careful when working with it so you don't break it. Since the thread itself was so thin, I paired it with the silk. From staring at the pictures, I've come to the conclusion that this is a simple fly stitch, with a few extra stitches here and there. This was also my first time working with Japan thread. I made a few stitches to test it before working on the front, where it would be the most visible. It's recommended that you work with shorter threads. The fewer times it has to pass through the fabric, the better. You should also avoid pulling at the thread with the needle and move the needle around so you don't have the thread rub up against it too long in one spot. I don't know if people make this out to be unnecessary scary or if I got my hands on the best quality of thread the embroidery world has ever seen, but I had less problems when I worked with a longer thread. It only broke on me when I cut it short because I had to pull more with the needle that way. It was also after finishing the first panel that I realized that the inside of the swirls were pointing the wrong way. The first panel took me about 25 hours to sew and not knowing how long I would spend on the rest of the coat, I decided to leave it and continue doing this for the rest of the embroidery. Since the pockets are lower on this pattern than the original jacket, the embroidery no longer matches up. Instead, I made it end in little swirls. Beside that, we have good photos of this part of the jacket and I copied it as well as I could. The same technique was used here as before, only a little faster.
The pocket flaps on this jacket are much smaller than the ones from history, but they make up for it with being absolutely fabulous. After embroidering, they were interfaced with horsehair canvas and stitched together. The flap was stitched to the front before stitching on the pocket bag. I use tiny stitching and a lot of ray check in the attempt to make these bulletproof. And the scariest thing I've had to do, probably in my entire life, was to cut these pockets open. The pockets are similar to the ones on the waistcoat and the top of the pocket bag is top stitched down with a prick stitch. The bottom half is also stitched down to make it lay nicely. With the front panels now done, I started on the lining. These coats need a lot of help in the way of interfacing to look nice. The lining was made of cotton canvas, the top part also had a layer of horsehair canvas, and the rest of the skirt was covered with the rest of my tie silk. The pattern does not tell you to do this, but I decided to add a strip of velvet as facing, since the jacket will be worn open. The front panel and lining were laid right sides together and stitched in the front.
The seam allowances were sewn to the facing and with the fronts finished I sewed on the last line of Zatash. I also stitched over the embroidery by machine to secure it. The seam allowances of the hem and vents were folded in and top stitched with a prick stitch. Moving on to the back panels, here it's nearly impossible to find good reference photos, there are no behind the scenes photos and we rarely see the actors from the back. This amazing Tumblr user did a great job at taking screenshots and enhancing them. I see these worlds in my dreams now and I'm pretty sure I can make out how they look from this picture. The worst part however is the top of the vents. I decided to copy the pattern over the pockets but I later found this picture where you can see that it's much fuller embroidered. One day I might go back and fill it in, but it is not in this video. After embroidering, I had the brilliant idea to add iron-on interfacing to secure the threads, but this made the fabric wrinkle, which it didn't do before, so I guess it wasn't such a good idea after all. The back lining was cut out of printed cotton canvas and the interfacing was sewn on with the stay stitch. The seam allowances of the skirt were folded in and sewn with a prick stitch. I laid the center backs right sides together and sewed it by machine. The top of the vents were tacked down by hand. The fold lines in the pattern didn't make much sense to me, but the center back is supposed to sag down lower than the rest of the hem according to the pattern. I pinned the fronts to the back and sewed the shoulder seams. This was a lot of fabric to get through and with my machine acting up, I broke several needles that day. The seam allowances were trimmed and fell down.
you haven't concrunched until you're working on your cosplay at another convention. The color is pretty easy. I followed the short variant on the pattern and embroidered it. It was interfaced and basted down before stitching it on by machine. The inside was whip stitched down. To make the collar stand properly, I had to add stitches at the top and bottom too. Even though the velvet is quite thick, it's not a structured fabric. Now that the collar is done, I can sew the side seams. This was tried on and pinned before basting and sewing. I messed up and added extra seam allowances to all of these patterns, but the smallest size is still very big on me. And I removed almost 20 centimeters on each side. After felling the seam allowances, I started on the sleeves. This should be simple enough, I thought. The lining was cut out of cotton canvas, but the bottom, which might be visible, was covered in silk. By this point I was aware of the extra seam allowances and I started by removing them and stitching up the sleeves. Easy enough. I pinned and basted them to the body to try them on. Four times I did this before deciding it was good enough. The pattern tells you to match the notches on the sleeves to the body, but there are no notches on this pattern. But fear not if you buy the waistcoat pattern as well. Those sleeves have notches. Modern sleeves hang straight down, but these ones are pointed forward, with the head of the sleeve towards the back. With my alterations to the sleeve and body, nothing fitted anymore, and I didn't have fabric to make new ones. I found the best way to stitch them on was with a ladder stitch from the outside, that way I could make it lay as nicely as possible. The last part to make are the cuffs. I hadn't cut them out because the pattern instructions didn't agree on which way was up and down. The pattern includes a rectangular piece you are to cut out twice and it then tells you to attach them along the non-existent curved line. I didn't want a seam in the embroidery so I marked the size of the cuffs on paper and scaled the embroidery to fit it. This became my cuff pattern. I saved the cuffs for the last part just because I didn't know what size they were going to be and I didn't want to cut anything out before I knew because I didn't buy more fabric than what I would need. Because of this I have to piece the lining part of this. So the front that will be embroidered will be cut out whole and then the lining will be uh, pieced just uh, with a seam down the middle, which is what the pattern asks for anyway, but because I'm doing embroidery similarly to the show, I'm not going to make a seam right there. I could definitely have just turned this and managed to cut out the other pieces, but because of the direction of the hairs on the velvet, it will look like it's a different color, and so it's going to look very out of place, even though it's only going to be a little bit of it that's showing at the top. If I'd only had tiny little scraps remaining, I would have cut out 
like bias tape or ribbons out of it and just used it along the edge of the lining because nothing else is going to show, hopefully. This was the last bit of embroidery I did on this project and hopefully the last I will be doing for quite a while. I ended up using 30 meters of the soutache, around 400 meters of the thread and perhaps 25 grams of sequins. Had I known how much material I needed, I would most likely have bought the French military wire instead. I don't know if it would have been easier to work with. My soutache looks beautiful, but it was annoying to use. It looked too large compared to the other elements. I also wish my thread was more visible from a distance like the one in the show, but seeing how beautiful this all turned out, I can't really complain. I spent exactly 85 hours on the embroidery alone, in total the jacket was made in around 100 hours, and the whole suit was made in 5 months. With that, I wanted to share the line that has been hanging over me for every minute working on this. It's this Instagram post saying how all the soutache was done in a day. Thoughts and prayers go out to the costumers working in film and TV. After sewing on the cuffs, I ended up painting a pair of buttons to match the colour. I can't make out what the buttons are supposed to look like in the pictures, but I think the size is correct. The last part was to add some padding to the shoulders. The jacket desperately needed this. Once again, the one in the show is a modern jacket, while this belongs in a museum. The padding was tacked on, the sleeve lining was finished, and finally fabric was draped to fit and stitched in. Mistakes were made, and there are things I wish I'd done differently, but I am extremely proud of what I've been able to make. And it's quite comfortable, even if it is very warm to wear for an entire convention. Thank you for following along. Until next time.
this will have to do. 